as the slides suggest, we are ready to begin session four. This is the fourth extension of the reach of the prolific and patient professor, and it will bring scholars and practitioners together to explore innovations in learning and instruction in classroom settings. We're going to entertain a fairly broad version of classroom settings as we discuss pedagogies that enable, that enable becoming, healing, transformation, and understanding of our human experiences. So who is this we of which I speak? Well, I'm John Thon Colson, a doctoral student at Teachers College and a research fellow at Dr. Gordon's Institute for Urban and Minority Education. On his behalf, I facilitate a weekly seminar on assessment and the service of learning, about which I'll speak briefly. And as this conference informs and is informed by those themes and those conversations, um, hopefully we'll be able to move some of what we're talking about into the work that we're doing there and then onward into many vehicles for change. I will turn first to Dr. Eleanor Armour Thomas, the chair of said seminar, who's published and edited several articles and books with the professor. Dr. Armour Thomas holds a joint appointment as Professor of Educational Psychology at Queens College, as well as at the Graduate School at the and the University Center of the University City University of New York. She will invite us into thinking about how learners learn. Following Dr. Armour Thomas is Dr. Joaquin Noguera, who will invite us to consider a world in which education helps learners and us all to heal and transform by repurposing schools. Dr. Naguera is currently a fellow at UCSB's Center for Black Studies Research and derives examples illustrative of the professor's charge from his dissertation fieldwork at the Roses and Concrete Community School, among others. His invitation to imagine better worlds is right aligned with the pre presentation to follow, that of Dr. Luis Gomez, who will speak of Gordon's North Star and in doing so, will draw a line from the work of the Gordon Commission almost a decade ago um, to what can be done to move from the realm of theory to impacting practice in classrooms. In addition to serving as professor of education at UCLA and as a senior fellow of networked improvement science at the Carnegie Foundation, Dr. Gomez has the honor of being the loving critic most often cited by the professor when discussing where this work needs to go. Following Dr. Gord, uh, Dr. Gomez's remarks, we'll go to Dr. Derek Mitchell who serves as the CEO of Partners in School Innovation and has been working directly with schools from California to Maryland. He will speak to the themes of resilience, accountability, and cognitive diversity in the professor's academic and professional work. Dr. Mitchell will then hand the proverbial mic to Dr. Eric Tucker, a co-founder of the Brooklyn Lab Charter School, as well as equitybydesign.org a former ETS Gordon Fellow and a teacher in Chicago and Providence, Rhode Island, Dr. Tucker will speak of justice and history to round out our opening remarks. I hope you find the presentations riveting and also that you collaboratively share some notes and questions using the Google Doc that I'm about to share in the chat right now. You'll see in that Google Doc that there's a space to introduce yourself to one another and to us and also to collaboratively co-construct some knowledge. Feel free to add your thoughts folks that you think are especially provocative, and then to tab out and with indentation to comment on one another's um, posts. Finally, there's a section for questions, and the more succinctly they are stated, the more likely they are to be advanced with speakers. I will get us started on our way with three questions that come up often, so if you don't mind moving to the next slide. In the seminar, we often discuss how assessments can inform and improve learning processes, or in other words, how rubber can meet the road. So for this session, I am hoping the panelists will speak to you and our audience members will think about specifically the pragmatics of this idea. If we've talked in the theory in the past, and we'll probably talk about that still in this session as well, to the extent possible, we have a bunch of scholars and practitioners and scholar practitioners. I really hope that we can start to think about what this means in practical terms that teachers, students, parents, community members, and otherwise can make actionable today. Uh, and so much as that's true, moving from the conceptual to the practical, who are the audiences for this? And from each of your various perspectives, 
who are you trying to bring this to? What changes are you trying to see? And who are your uh, co-conspirators, your collaborators in that work? And finally, what, what, what must we learn or unlearn about the role of assessment and that we can think about any other aspect of the teaching and learning dialectic, but what needs to be learned and unlearned? Um, next slide, if you don't mind, will move us to two years worth of seminar transcripts, uh, word clouded. Um, I was in the habit of hand transcribing, so you'll uh, perhaps see some typos that I regularly made in some uh, shorthand. But for the most part, this um, should give you an idea of the constellation of ideas that we're exploring and help you to get oriented within it. Um, learning, assessment, big words, but some of the smaller words might be a, a particular impact or import because this is over 450 pages worth of transcription. Uh, in so much as that's true, I imagine that we'll move in any number of directions, but we have North Stars, we have some orientation, and we have some great speakers. Um, so I will turn to the first of them, Dr. Eleanor Armour Thomas. The mic is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you. And thank you, fellow panelists, for being here to chat. And of course, we have the presence of the great professor, which gives me a little nervousness in what I'm about to say because he's there to correct me or give me some, I don't know what, <laughs> when, we, when we are done. But anyway, welcome, Professor. Uh, but before I begin, uh, I would like to thank the faculty, the staff of UCLA and UCSB for organizing this great conference. And to Eva and Richard, my fellow seminarians, right? Um, Jonathan, that's how we call ourselves, uh, for inviting me to participate in this celebratory event of our dear, dear Professor Gordon. Like so many of us here, it has been a privilege, an honor to work with him, to debate his conceptual ideas, one of which is my topic for today in pursuit of intellective competence. And for those who may want to know more about this concept, simply read his tomes about pedagogical imaginations. It's a, quite a treat. For the professor, uh, mastery of domain specific knowledge and skills may not be enough to meet the intellective demands for modern democratic and pluralistic societies such as the US of A. In fact, he has argued that the goal of education is less about what learners are expected to know and to do in any given academic domain or discipline of interest, but more about the cultivation of their intellective competence, which he describes as learners' awareness and use of their affective, their cognitive, their metacognitive and situative mental processes to solve novel and common problems. In fact, I think he has created a new term, metamentation, to capture the essence of his concept of intellective competence. So how do we enable learners to become electively competent? He has some ideas about that too. <laughs> In fact, he believes for more than many, many years that we, I can bear to remember since I've known him, the, about the integration of pedagogical processes. And for him, these pedagogical processes include assessment, teaching, and learning. And he believes it's the key to the development of their intellective competence in and out of school settings. In fact, some years ago, he coined the term pedagogical troika to capture the dynamic interdependence of these processes each used in the service of the other. Well, some 15 years ago, along with Erica Walker, Dr. Walker, who is uh, now a professor of mathematics education at Teachers College and the director of UMI, the professor and myself, we put our heads together based on the professor's ideas and came up with a term 
dynamic pedagogy, which we thought then and still do now is a pedagogical innovation for improving learning and teaching in elementary and middle school classrooms. Since then, I have been trying to operationalize the model in working with high school in-service teachers and also continuing to work with the professor in and debating the role of curriculum in dynamic pedagogy and his now use of pedagogical analytics to mine the data from assessments for use in subsequent learning and teaching. That is to improve subsequent learning and teaching. So some of the takeaways from the early work and my continuing discussions with him about operationalization of dynamic pedagogy that we believe hold promise for cultivating intellective competence in the classroom are as follows. The first one, teachers need to understand how learners learn. Of course, they do know how learners learn, but the way I'm thinking about how learners learn is based on research ideas about um, how learners access their knowledge, their prior knowledge, and how they use that knowledge to, to build on that prior knowledge, to construct new knowledge, how they consolidate that new knowledge, and how they transfer it to that new knowledge to different contexts. So in understanding how learners learn and making the intellective processes for learning the target of dynamic pedagogy is what is one of the takeaways from our continuing um, struggles to figure out how to match the conceptual ideas with what might be going on in the classroom. The other one is adaptation of learning experiences to the functional characteristics of the learner. In fact, that's another of uh, Professor Gordon's term, uh, which he calls behavioral tendencies, such as the cognitive, the emotional, the cultural patterns of an individual's response to specific environmental stimuli. Learners bring these functional characteristics to a learning activity that influence the approach to the task at hand. The nature and quality of the intellective engagement and how they use resources in the tasks that they engage. In the classroom, the teacher has to be mindful of these functional characteristics when they design and use instructional curriculum and assessment tasks to engage learners in activities and always in mind with the goal of enabling them to bring to full bloom their intellective potential. The third one, personalizing teaching learning transactions, uh, that has more to do with the casting of uh, academic learning in the context of the individualization of the relationship between the learner and the teacher or the learner and capable peers or the learner and any uh, significant other, whoever that may be in the classroom or outside the classroom. And we believe that when learners engage consistently in personalized learning experiences, they do develop agency and autonomy in their learning that contributes to the development of intellective competence. The other one, uh, next slides, please. Yeah, there are three of them. The sufficiency of human and material materials. That's a, again, another of the professor's ideas. In a little book he wrote many years, well, not so many years ago, I think it was in 1999, about education and justice. He talked a lot about the difference between equity and equality. And two of the concepts for him in equity is the, the, the sufficiency and the adequacy of human and material resources that need to be in play if we are to enable youngsters to develop their intellective potential. So successful implementation, another takeaway for dynamic pedagogy will be a need for enough competent teachers who know when and how to use diagnostic, appraisal, analytical functions of assessment to ascertain learners' strengths and needs and interests. When and how to use instructional scaffolding 
on, on feedback strategies, how to make decisions about sequencing tasks at the, diff the difficulty level of those tasks. Multiple ways of becoming intellectually competent. Well, I'll briefly say diversity in functional characteristics, the perspectives, attribution they bring to the learning activity, the pluralistic demands of our society in which learners live, the differential opportunities to learn for some learners will necessitate multiple pathways for them to become intellectually competent. And finally, uh, the last one, a few years ago, Dr. William Penrill used the term infrastructuring to describe the practices in schools and districts that provide supports that aim to sustain innovations in classroom. For dynamic pedagogy, such practices will include site-based professional development for teachers in the use of instructional curriculum and assessment materials, how to conduct educative assessment that specifically inform learning, data management systems for tracking and management of each learner's progress in learning. And finally, for learners, such practice will include supplementary opportunities for them to engage in teaching and learning experiences that foster agency and autonomy in their own learning. Thank you very much. I think I try to stay within the time limits, which is very hard. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And thank you, Professor. I, I hope you give me more than a C plus. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Armour Thomas. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from you in just a bit, but first let's turn to Dr. Nogueira. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, it's a pleasure to share space with you all today. I just wanted to start by saying that in the spirit of healing and justice, I acknowledge and honor the indigenous people of this land. I'm calling from Gabrielina Tongva land, and uh, I work at UC Santa Barbara, which is Chumash land. I also um, want to uh, offer uh, respect to those who were brought to this land to work this land against their will and uh, respect to ancestors, elders, and our relatives and relations past and present and emerging and um, recognize our obligations to those communities. It is really a pleasure to be able to join this group, um, to be able to contribute alongside friends, mentors, people I admire, um, and to be able to contribute to the discourse that honors doc, uh, the legacy of Dr. Ed, uh, Edmund Gordon. Uh, Dr. Gordon, I, I know you don't know me, but um, you offered my father his first academic job. And so I have known about you for a very long time. <laughs> Um, it, it's a pleasure to share space, virtual space with you here. Um, in a talk that Dr. Gordon gave back in February of 2020, he said, stated that uh, school is important, but it is not the end of education, nor is it the beginning. And uh, in that conversation, he was speaking about the fact that children learn first from the, the adults in their lives and in their homes, and that learning is relational. It is emotional, and it is to some degree political, right? Um, we learn more than we can fully account for at home. And we come to school with that knowledge and culture and those gifts and um, education, true education can embrace that, but schooling often, unfortunately, does does not. Um, I, I'm not sure, Dr. Gordon, if you wanted to say something, you look like you wanted to say something just now. No. You're on mute. <laughs> I think the mute button is yeah. evasive. Okay, yeah, well, I, <laughs> I think we're gonna we're gonna get more time for um, discussion. I'm sure you can. Um, we'll sure we'll, 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 we'll sure get him in. Okay, um, well, so the title of, of the, what I've prepared for today is called "Another World Is Possible," and in it, where many worlds fit. Um, I was invited by Dr. Duran to kind of speak to this theme of cultural context and affirmative pedagogies, uh, but also several other topics that Dr. Gordon addresses uh, through his works from uh, personalization of teaching and learning and issues of equity and equality. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, my focus is on um, healing and transformation, education that can support healing and transformation. So I wanted to start by um, just kind of putting all of this up there, this image here is um, an image I often use 
to engage folks in a conversation, a critical discussion about schools in the United States, because schools play such an important role in our society. They are at once able to enable uh, upward mobility um, and oftentimes complicit in maintaining the status quo and reproducing inequality. Uh, it is no accident and it is not new. Um, as the authors of Culturally Sustaining Pedagogies have recently argued, um, not so recent, 2017, that the purpose of state-sanctioned schooling in the United States has largely been to forward uh, the assimilationist and often violent white imperial project with students and families being asked to lose or deny their languages, literacies, cultures, and histories in order to achieve in school. Historically, I argue in my own work um, that the, the norms of schooling through the culture, through the organizational structure, through the system structures, practices, and processes that are used in everyday schooling, we often um, naturalize the status quo. Uh, and, and many educators today um, are asking questions about the potential for schools to be repurposed. What would it mean and what would it take for schools to function as centers of health, well being, and revitalization in communities? What kind of conditions do we need to establish? for all students to be able to thrive? And what kind of relationships do schools need to have with the communities with which they are situated in, um, in order to support the mobilization of those communities that are perhaps more disengaged or may not view um, schools as spaces where hope, um, of hope. Um, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, okay. So part of what I, I uh, wanted to share today are uh, four different examples of studies that I've been a part of, um, three of which I am I'm leading, one that I was able to support that attempt to repurpose schools um, and, and forward uh, either culturally sustaining or healing centered or simply community responsive models of education. Um, so the first is an example of tribal and nationhood uh, mobilization through indigenous language immersion programs. Indigenous language immersion schooling is an innovative approach in which most or all instruction occurs in the indigenous language with a strong culture-based curriculum uh, with the goal of promoting language revitalization, ac academic holistic well-being, and cultural identity and continuance, ILIs a, a form of sustainable self-determination. Um, it is a form of re reclamation as well, uh, because the revitalization of language and culture that have been endangered through settler colonialism and schooling um, is, is central to uh, fostering holistic well-being, uh, cultural identity and continuance, and is, by those who are practicing it, a form of decolonizing education towards indigenous nation building. Mm -hmm. uh, next is an example uh, of a district that I'm working with right here in the Bay Area. Uh, this is the San Mateo Foster City School District that recognized it had a gaping wound in their community. Nearly a decade ago, they closed one of the schools in a working class and predominantly community of color and um, largely as a result of an unresolved uh, achievement gap. The result was that the community was burdened by the need to commute long distances that few else few others in the in the community are burdened by. Um, so the district recognized they, they wanted to right this wrong. They recognized they did not have the capacity. They did not know where to start. So they reached out for help. Um, they brought in some outsiders who engaged that community and asked the community what they wanted and what they need. At the same time, uh, researched similar populations um, and successful models and decided that they would be supporting a culturally and linguistically responsive community school. They recognized they also needed wraparound services to account for the inequity in the community that was not experienced in other parts of the district. Um, that has now led to a parent-driven uh, school design project, as well as district-wide equity evaluation and assessment um, in order to inform strategic planning for development and improvement. <clears throat> The next example is a community driven effort uh, called the Roses and Concrete Community School. This was the site of my dissertation study. Um, 
this was a school that was born out of East Oakland in response to a community's demand for self-determination in education. And what followed was not only the creation of a culturally sustaining, healing-centered, community-responsive educational space um, that served pre predominantly Black and Latinx students, but also um, a rich program that was based on ethnic studies, Spanish English dual immersion, one of the few that is serving half a half black population in, in, a, in a dual emergence setting. And although the, the school is no longer in operations, hundreds of students and families um, experienced the benefits of, of a space that was designed in their image to a large degree. <clears throat> Finally, at a different level of scale, I'm working with Palisades Charter High School, um, a, an educator by the name of Giovanni Stewart, who is the director of campus unification, is in the process of, of developing uh, various uh, classes and interventions in the school that are intended to humanize students and uh, support stronger relationships between the teachers and, and those that they serve. Um, he is drawing from ethnic studies, restorative practices, and ultimately teaching students how to conduct their own research, targeting Black students who then are shifting um, their gaze, the gaze of educators, um, and um, kind of re-establishing a new dynamic in terms of knowledge construction, the student's relationship with knowledge construction. Um, all of these examples require mobilization of, um, of communities and individuals in those communities um, to recognize, as one of my mentors, Dr. Luis Gomez, has emphasized, the difference between knowledge of and the knowledge of how to, right? We, we, um, that we have to know our role in this and we actually need to recognize when we need support. And this is all intended to intentionally reshape and re-establish uh, a different kind of classroom environment. Um, again, this work, I would argue, requires a move away from colorblind approaches to towards a recognition, recognition and appreciation of difference. Um, uh, it, it recalls for collaborative and generative spaces that uh, bring together different stakeholder groups and um, we should recognize that equity in the context of work with historically oppressed peoples is always an opportunity for greater self-determination and holistic engagement. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. It's a pleasure to be able to contribute. That was a powerful end note and a great presentation. We'll now move to said mentor, Dr. Lewis Gomez. It has to happen at least once, and, and uh, I apologize for it. I am happy to be here with you all, um, and it's a great pleasure to um, to spend a little bit of time talking about the impact of Professor Gordon's ideas on me, um, and and to um, sort of to to honor his, his to honor your intellectual power just for a moment. So let, let's go to the first slide. I, I've, 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 I've taken up this theme in other contexts talking about uh, Professor Gordon's work. I think that we live in, in, this, in this notion is North Stars. And for me, a North Star is something that provides guidance over the very, very long haul. And part of the challenge of a North Star is to provide us guidance when we live in, and to be intellectually dependable in an ever-changing world of ideas. In short, to help us pick what we attend to over the long haul to make progress. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, Professor Gordon is the sort of the embodiment in some ways of a North Star. So we honor you for that reason to give, giving us guidance and direction over the very long haul. And part of providing us guidance has been your ideas. And I think that elements of, of Gordon's true north are intellective competence and character and affirmative development. They emphasize the world, the role of agency in change. And Ed, your work has also helped us understand that a true North Star, something like agency, is not captured in a simple task or technology, it's much more profound than that. It's captured in the way we approach work and the way we approach change. And to Gordon's ideas, 
I'd like to add just two notions. One notion is powerful ideas like Professor Gordon's ideas need to be disciplined by thinking by part of our true North being every person every day. We need to think about how we support agency for everyone every day in every school. And the second notion I'd like to add is the idea that we need to come to a common language of how we achieve for the very long haul things like intellective competence and character and affirmative development. The next slide, please. So true north, intellectual competence and characters as a true north. Uh, the, in talking about the Gordon Commission in one ETS document, it says it, it says it is the capacity to appreciate, and know, and understand the human experience in order to make sense of the world, and achieve novel and and to address novel and specific problems reflects both habits of mind, quality, and even the goodness and the products of cognition. Adopting something like this as a true North means that we have to recognize, as the Gordon Commission did, that a complex ecology makes that happen. And that complex ecology has to share a common language of action. That complex ecology needs to take these very big ideas and drive them to theaters of practice across a country. So in order to do that, we must accept the primacy of translational research, research that takes these big ideas and introduces them into practice, what Eleanor Armour said just a moment ago that Bill Penuel called infrastructuring, so another language for that. We need to talk about the primacy of implementation studies and how to accelerate into implementation the kinds of ideas like those ha that have been Professor Gordon's true north for an entire career. And in, in the doing of this, we recognize that justice and equity live in these details of infrastructuring. So our challenge is to take the, two, the true north that Professor Gordon and colleagues have offered to us and translate them in rigorous ways into practice that has impact on every child every day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. We will move now to Dr. Derek Mitchell. The floor is yours. I'm uh, uh, amazed and um, uh, somewhat humbled by the brilliance with which you organized these sessions, because Dr. Gomez ended right at the exact spot that uh, that my work uh, really begins and starts to reflect. Uh, Dr. Gordon, you may not remember this, but uh, there was a time in the 90s um, in my career where I was deciding whether to go with the EDD approach or the PhD approach. And my advisor, Dr. Eva Baker, uh, said to me, before you decide, you need to meet my friend, Ed. Um, and so she introduced us uh, and we had a long conversation. And at the crux of the discussion and the decision for me was my, the importance of implementation on the ground, the importance of practice to me. Um, and I had seen and read so many of the great thinkers who, who frankly, eschewed practice. <laughs> they, they were really about the ideas and not the people who, who are going to be responsible for actually implementing them. And you helped me understand that, that, that that's not a dialectic, <laughs> right? That there's, there's no, no, uh, no need for or expectation around making any kind of choice because the work is the work. Um, and, uh, and that thought has permeated my thinking and my work since that point in time. Um, and so I appreciate you for that uh, nugget of wisdom and for all the other 101 ways um, that your work has informed the work that we do at Partners in School Innovation. Um, next slide, please. Um, in trying to understand and articulate clearly in just five minutes, um, the, the many ways that we've integrated um, some of the brilliant thinking um, that Dr. Gordon has shared with the world. Um, it was a difficult task and I decided to actually uh, tackle it 
um, in what I think are the most critical uh, and reflective ways for now, where we are in education. Um, and it's you know really represented by the three words that you see on the screen first. It, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Gordon was was uh, having and writing brilliantly and and deeply about resilience as far back as you know the seventies and eighties. Um, uh, and, but within context that uh, you know the people of color and 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 urban you know students at that point in time and and the power with which they found their way through these systems designed not for them to be successful um, was a was really a kind of a core uh, um, inquiry for Dr. Gordon. He talked about the competencies and the skills um, that are developed in that process, but he didn't do it in a way that was divorced from the understanding of the inequity of some kids needing to withstand their schools as opposed to you learn from them and 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 uh, and be catapulted forward in their in their in their academic uh, pursuits, um, and so this idea of of building the competencies and skills that allow folks to overcome barriers and challenges is a core um, of what we do in our work at Partners. The second, which is a little bit trickier, is this idea of accountability um, and. You know, looking back on the accountability era in public education, um, we may think that what had happened in the last 22, 25 years was sort of assumed, a fait accompli. Um, but when you look back at Dr. Gordon's readings, uh, you'll find that he, among a, a small group of others, were cautioning policymakers and decision makers all the way through that accountability has to be deeply personal responsibility. Um, and that you know, using data in ways that demean, demoralize, and dismiss the work of, of teachers and leaders was not going to get us where we needed to go. <laughs> um, uh, we needed data to inform them, not to deform them. Um, in fact, I think that was a phrase that was used in, in one of his speeches about the fact. Um, and so the work that Partners does to help teachers and leaders make local meaning of the contextual data that allows them to better understand the needs of students um, and how diverse those needs are and then develop programming and supports to meet those needs on the ground is a is a key component of what we what we do every day and this last idea of cognitive diversity the 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 idea that not all students are going to learn linearly they're not all going to connect authentically with every teacher um, that the that the educational enterprise is too varied, too diverse um, to expect, uh, you know, a, a mathematical computation that would produce, you know, the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, that instead we needed schools to be far more adaptive and responsive, um, resources to be far more diverse, um, and that the frame for teaching and leading needs to be about listening. Um, listening to families, listening to school to students, um, and unearthing the brilliance that's already there. Um, and and you may recognize this language as assets based thinking. So it's been popularized now. But uh, Dr. Gordon was 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 having those conversations, you know, really decades ago. Um, so next slide, please. So these three core comp competencies or ideas are embedded in the approach that we use every day. We're supporting 67 schools in four states right now. And um, that work of, of how does this work make teachers and leaders better able to meet the needs of diverse populations of students um, every day in a way that's affirming, that's respectful, um, uh, and that opens their minds to their own possibilities as agents of change uh, to produce the, the work we need to do um, is core to the partner's approach. Um, this idea of improvement science, not as a, a intellectual exercise of a series of steps, you know, uh, that folks take that are gonna magically produce outcomes, um, but instead of a series of conversations and relationships that, uh, increase in their richness as we learn more about what one another needs to be our best selves um, is the core of, of, of the work that we do. And so, Dr. Gordon, um, next slide, please. I also wanted you to know that, uh, you know, we have this army of change agents 
um, who have taken these ideas to heart and are, are driving change every day so that this extraordinarily rich, you know, uh, panoply of, of, of expertise that you've contributed to the field is actually being gobbled up um, <laughs> by families and kids and teachers and leaders across the country um, in digestible ways that are respectful for their difference um, and helping them make some decisions about the kind of world we all want to inhabit um, going forward. So thank you for everything that you do and have done. And I uh, appreciate this time to share our thinking. Time well spent. Thank you very much for your work and for this presentation. We're going to come back to all these. We got some themes percolating now. Um, first, let's move to Dr. Eric Tucker. The mic is yours. Edmund Taylor, E.T. Gordon, spent a measure of his career driving his 1920 Buick through the back roads of Wayne County, North Carolina, to make house calls for his patients. His son, Edmund W. Gordon, often rode along on the passenger side. The two were returning from a house call in the country one afternoon when they stumbled upon a pickup truck with a cage resting on its bed. Gordon recalls that four black men were locked inside the cage. As E.T.'s Buick inched closer, the truck bed burst into flames. While the white driver and guards fled the cabin of the burning vehicle, E.T. rushed towards the cage, struggling to release the latch in hope of preventing four fiery deaths. The metal seared E.T.'s hands, but the door eventually swung open and the men escaped with his assistance. The guards, who would have let all four men burn alive, shot one of the prisoners as he scrambled to safety. E.T. shielded the other three and then tended their burns. Three men lived that day, and one country doctor exceeded his responsibility to do no harm. This paper draws on 200 plus hours of transcribed interviews and tens of thousands of pages of archival records as a part of our Gordon Legacy biography project. Today, I argue that those that poured support and love into Professor Edmund W. Gordon and those he has poured into help us understand meaningful aspects of what it takes to support humans to learn and thrive. We are hearing important stories over this two days about Gordon's ties to W.E.B. Du Bois, Doxy Wilkerson, Elsa Hauserman, Charles White, and others. To complement, but not supplant these, I'm selecting a handful of, of the dozens of vignettes in the biography we're preparing. Gordon's family lore begins with Jack. Born John Howland around 1806, he fled slavery when he was a young man escaping across intercoastal plains and marshes under cover of night, seeking refuge on and around the Outer Banks of North Carolina. In 1840, Jack married Eliza, a Black and Native American woman from the Atlantic coast. The couple gave her surname, Allison, to each of their children like a protective charm. Her name, they prayed, might prevent bounty hunters from kidnapping their children invoking the Fugitive Slave Act and returning them as chattel to the Howlands. But that didn't stop their son, Frank Ellison, from thriving. Growing up in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, he aided by, and aided by Reconstruction, Frank achieved success. He courted and wed Rosa Ellison, the former yard child of William Pickett, a general in the Confederate Army. Working as a boat pilot along the coast, Captain Frank delivered passengers and freight between the mainland and barrier island communities. As the fleet he owned grew, he earned contracts to deliver U.S. mail and won a seat on the town council of Beaufort, North Carolina. Frank and Rosa were blessed with four sons and two daughters. One of these daughters, Maybelle Lorraine Edison, gave birth to Edmund Wyatt Gordon in June of 1921, within days of the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacres. On his dad's side, Robert Gordon Sr. was born in Jamaica and educated in Scotland, 
before returning as an ordained Presbyterian minister. When E.T. and his brother Robert completed sixth form exams at the end of secondary school, their father sent them to Shaw University in Raleigh. Upon graduation from medical school in 1909, E.T. moved to Goldsboro and set up an office. By 1918, the Spanish flu hit with deadly forests. E.T., a restless adult student of chemistry, biology, and medicine, designed and built a tent to provide an antiviral respiratory treatment. Symptomatic whites and blacks turned to E.T. for treatment. Of the hundreds, perhaps thousands of patients sick enough to pursue this novel and costly treatment, Gordon recollects that only two passed away. This success bolstered E.T.'s standing in town. He exercised his power judiciously. One day, E.T. and a white colleague averted a lynching in a country jail or in the county jail. A longtime black resident's teenage son had been arrested for living with his girlfriend, who happened to be white. While the teenager sat in a cell, a crowd of white men gathered outside the courthouse, growing increasingly impatient. The mood was violent. Precedent suggested that it was a matter of time before they took the law into their own hands. His colleagues worked to console the agitated crowd as E.T. pressed through the crowd to the front door of the jail. Not long after, E.T. exited the jailhouse through its back door with the accused young man in tow. E.T. drove the teenager some 75 miles to a train depot outside of the crowd's deadly reach and made sure he got a train heading north. E.T. frequently reminded his son that people who are privileged have responsibilities for helping less privileged people. Gordon's family shaped him. Next slide, please. Mother Maybell ensured her children were included in family discussions and were expected to be present and to speak with guests in our home. Maybell's uncle, or Maybell's brother, Uncle Fernie Ellison, was a pastor for 40 years at the Reeves Memorial Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, where he built a financial and political power base as a deal maker. His uncle Fernie taught him that Black leaders should only consider participation purposeful if they have a seat at the table where decisions get made. Sister Rose, someone who could learn almost everything she set her mind to, matriculated to Howard in 1935. When Gordon arrived on campus a year later at age 15, he was best known as Rose's little brother. At Howard, faculty poured in to Gordon. Professor Elaine Locke insisted that Rose's little brother, upon his return from academic suspension, come to his office at least one hour a week so that he could teach him how to be a student. Locke gave Gordon a book on how to read academic text, provided feedback on draft papers, and monitored progress on assignments. On assignments. Gordon assisted the team of litigators Charles Houston was amassing at Howard Law, including Thurgood Marshall. Victories culminated in Brown v. Board. Gordon's later work with James Coleman and the Harvard Seminar advanced notions of meaningful, equal educational opportunity that emphasize quality, sufficiency, and appropriateness. Gordon resonated with his professor Howard Thurman's search for a common destiny, his charge that we ask not what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive, then go do it because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Susan Git Gordon, his wife and partner for 70 years before her physical passing, had a full career as a professor of pediatrics and a long tenure as an activist and public intellectual. With her husband, she raised four children whom they both consider to be their most important contributions to society. The editorial page of Susan's father's, J.W. Gitt's paper, the York Gazette and Daily, expressed his commitment to justice and pacifism. He outlined the Progressive Party platform thusly, stand for 
and fight for a more equitable distribution of the products of the soil and the factory, a foreign policy which will encourage peace and goodwill, protect labor in its right to bargain on equal terms, put into practice the American ideal of equality, do the planning necessary to make full employment continuous. On the occasion of Gordon's 101st birth year, we honor his singularly wide and deep influence on education and civil rights. Like his mentors, Du Bois and Locke, Gordon is one of America's most influential public intellectuals. His resolute engagement with matters of pressing social concern continually yield justice in an era that desperately needs his legacy. Thank you. Just gonna let some silence ride on that. Wow, those vignettes were hidden. Thank you very much, Dr. Tucker. Thank you to all of the panelists. I'm gonna note one more time that there is a Google Doc available for folks that would like to share any questions. I'd also like to note, Dr. Gordon, that I'm gonna discuss some of what we've heard for a moment, and then I'm gonna to turn to you and give you the opportunity, if you'd like, to share. If you've got your mic ready to go, uh, we're always happy to hear from you. Um, that was a powerful set of discussions and interwoven. I heard Dr. Armour Thomas and Dr. Gomez both talking about intellective confident, competence and uh, this idea of re infrastructuring. I think we could talk a little bit about what that means in pragmatic steps. Dr. Gomez also was talking about a true north and cited his mentees uh, ideas about next steps at being, being at many levels. Um, I want to cite Dr. Nagora's phrase that that is going to be some learning that happens both relationally and emotionally. It tinges political. And I think thinking about that second question that I posed about the various actors, co-conspirators, possible agitators and obstacles is something that really needs to be discussed in the midst of all of this. If we're going to enable social mobility, we've also got to think about how Historically, education has tracked and domained human growth for some of us more than others, and how we kick some of those obstacles out of the way so that we can really recognize the fullness of opportunity um, of our species. Uh, Dr. Mitchell talked about that diversity of cognition, about this diversity of human excellences. In fact, our excellences are as diverse as we are, um, but that comes to the importance of practice. I, I felt that that was a really important note that being in the realm of theory, we can sometimes standardize and the standardizing and the generalizing often does center privilege. And that doesn't tend to play out in the dimensions and directions that we're hoping to talk about. And in so much as that we can kind of get to one of the statements that hit hardest for me, accountability has to be deeply personal. We need to be looking at what we're doing with assessments, what we're doing with the measurement of teachers, what we're doing with community leaders, and think about whether that does inform or deform, whether it is informed by or is deformed by those relationships. Um, one of the notes that kind of came up was this revitalization and reclamation note in Dr. Nagora's uh, statement, just how much our local leaders in control of the processes in control of the materials being used in their schools and control of the data and the conversations about data. In a recent conversation that I was having we were talking about that form that comes from a standardized test in which there's a band and there's an area with a number and some categories. And my friend who I went to high school with was looking at his daughter's form and had no idea what the categories or the numbers on it meant or what to do with it. Um, and so much as that one of the questions that I posed to us was about how assessment is informing teaching and learning. Uh, I invite us into thinking about the pragmatics of the documents being served to communities and uh, exactly how that is supposed to lead to progressive change between parents, school leaders, and other community figures. Uh, I think it was kind of perfect that Dr. Tucker then came in with a number of vignettes to think about what this means pragmatically. A lot of the learning that we have doesn't happen in a classroom. It happens when we look to the leaders in our communities and see the hardships they've come through, the sacrifices they've made, the people they've looked to for inspiration and the people that they've inspired. And so all of those anecdotes, I think, bring us to thinking about what education can be uh, 
that is our true north. Dr. Gordon's life, Dr. Gordon himself is a true north, as Dr. Gomez said. And in so much as that is true, that idea of a true north and that critique of some of the work that's happened so far as being a little bit more conceptual leaning. Um, I'll just open it up first to any of the panelists that would like to think together with us out loud about what are the pragmatic next steps in the direction of true north? Jonathan, can I thank you? And, and thank you, uh, panelists. I was afraid that I would be sitting here crying rather than talking at the end of your contributions. Uh, thank you very much. I want to pick up one thing that I think uh, at least two of you, maybe three of you mentioned, and that's uh, accountability. I'm glad somebody dug up that paper. I've got to go back and read it because I pray that in that piece, I moved as I think uh, Derek said, from accountability to responsibility. What I was trying to do in that piece and what I hope I tried to do in my career was to model the highest form of accountability, which is uh, responsibility. Accountability is really the external judgment. Responsibility is the internal judgment. If I feel responsible, I will be accountable. If I don't feel responsible, it's gonna be hard for me to be accountable. Can I follow up? Of course you can. And thank you, Dr. Gordon, for those thoughts. Take it away, Dr. Gomez. I, I want to follow up. I mean, I think that what you just said, it makes, especially about the, the, um, the internal dimension of responsibility. And I, I want to connect it to, 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 to Derek's comments in that when you have the part of the part of our joint responsibility is to provide mechanisms and to co-create mechanisms with the people we seek to serve mm -hmm. in order that they then can have that very sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when I look at Derek's army of change, mm -hmm. that's the role that they serve. And that mm -hmm. our role in helping to make armies like that possible is the big challenge that faces our generation. Because at some level, it's possible to, to form responsibility in small clumps with small groups of people in isolated ways, but to make it, to use Joaquin's word, to make it a national project is a first class intellectual challenge. And when I listen to Derek talk about this, you realize the magnitude of it because we have never as a people done it before. Mm -hmm. Well said. I'm gonna let that ride anybody that wants to move from there. I'll jump in. Uh, the, the examples I shared um, focused on communities where people felt ready. And if we're paying attention to what's going across the country, we see not everyone is in the same place of readiness. And I think there's something to that, to recognizing um, willingness and readiness, even if the internal organizational alignment with those visions for change are not there yet, as Dr. Gomez was speaking about that that need is the key to the equity and justice, right? Um, but creating, working with the with those who are willing and ready, and and in a in a in a manner that prioritizes mutual accountability, right? Um, that we're it's not just 
something that's happening to other people. It's something that we're also living, um, as Dr. Gordon has been <laughs> emphasizing, right? Um, but that we are intentional about creating generative spaces and allowing those different stakeholders to come together to build what can't be built alone. Um, I think that's a big, a big part of this work. You touched agree. on the theme of transactionality. Actually, I'm going to you, Dr. Aram Thomas, about personalizing those transactions. I was hoping you'd speak to it and you're ready to. Let's hear. Yes, uh, Dr. Nagara, I really love what you just said. The coming together, and Dr. Mitchell, you did too. And to have that change, th that set of change agents, that is so remarkable. I would love to take a picture of that to know that what could be possible when everyone come together with a principle of equity permeating their work, equity for all, justice for all, not only having it as an aspirational concept, but a livable one. And how do you live equity? How do you list justice if not in collaboration with other like-minded folks like you? And with that, so many possibilities uh, manifest themselves. So many opportunities will manifest themselves toward moving toward the true north, as Dr. Gomez has said. Wonderful, thank you. One of the reasons that it's a uh, powerful moment to honor Professor Gordon's legacy uh, is that we're in a deeply broken uh, moment uh, and dynamic uh, as a country right now. And looking back to the rich uh, you know, resources that Professor Gordon has built for us, the tools that he's created uh, just matters. Um, so as one example, uh, in 1991, he published a report, One Nation, uh, Many Peoples, uh, for New York State's Board of Regents that was a declaration of cultural uh, interdependence. The way that he threaded the needle on how we might build common ground and share language around culturally responsive and sustaining practices uh, 30 years ago is worth going back and studying on this topic of accountability and responsibility. Uh, mm -hmm. In 1986, on behalf of New York City's Chancellor's uh, Commission on Minimum Standards that he chaired, uh, he wrote a report, Foundations of Academic Excellence, that uh, both established system-wide floors for schools and subgroups, but also provided a very rich conception of how standards, responsibility, accountability interact in a world that respects the dignity of young people, the professionalism of educators, the aspiration of families. Uh, there's a paper by Linda Darling Hammond that she drew on in her remarks yesterday uh, from uh, that I think she first prepared in 91 called Accountability, Responsibility, and Standards. And she closes with this quote from Professor Gordon uh, after reflecting on his work on minimum standards, where she says, uh, she quotes Professor Gordon as saying, of course, the title of scholar, intellectual doctor, or professor does not make a person responsible for the state of humanity. However, it does entail the responsibility to provide the conceptual leadership, uh, which enables society to engage in self-corrective action. We're at a moment where there's an opportunity not just to, to honor the legacy of the Gordon Commission uh, and the importance that uh, the, the kind of reimagining ass assessment, the important lever that that might play, um, but also I think to tackle accountability uh, and the deeply dysfunctional things we've been doing as a society over the last 20, 30 years and the moment we're at, uh, where on the one hand, the center isn't holding, uh, and we've retreated, uh, you know, you know, to you know, to, uh, uh, to to various sides. But there's a possibility of building on Professor Gordon's legacy of building and finding and generating common ground uh, that is uh, inspiring enough to draw us together to figure out what do young people, teachers, school communities, families need from accountability, responsibility, and assessment. Mm -hmm. I would only add that that and absolutely 
think the, the opportunity is really there. But I would add that um, young people have to be at the center of it um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the most important for me right now is um, all of us are kind of implicated by the barriers and the structures um, that uh, have produced the situation that we find ourselves in. And if you've had any conversations with young people, you realize they're not. <laughs> <laughs> they askew all those structures. They they don't trust them. They don't believe in them. Um, and and that open the possibilities that we in this room can't see, but that is that is part of their lived uh, truth. Is I think the only way forward. They have to lead um, this work of bringing us all together, and we and we have to uh, be willing to follow um, uh, in this work. We, we tell teachers in our work that they are the most untapped resource for transformational change in our society. They're, they outnumber police, firemen, social workers combined in, in any community. And they're in relationship with everyone who influences what kids know or aren't able to, to, to do or should be. And because of that, uh, uh, they are inherently positioned to be agents of transformational change. Um, and they should feel a connection to the history, the history that Eric brought to the table, um, uh, uh, the social justice arc that education mm -hmm. is actually on, um, and, and be empowered by that, uh, as opposed to feeling you know, sort of uh, implicated by it. I think understanding the needs of our kids and putting their voices central in our improvement work is, is going to be the way forward. their needs, their capabilities, their aspirations. It's just wonderful to see a generation getting free. And uh, in so much as that we can look to them for leadership, it's a, a new kind of challenge for all of us. Um, it's interesting to look forward. It's also interesting to look back. Dr. Tucker was kind of talking about some of the strong headwinds we face. Um, We've come from a Brown decision that's being re-envisioned to Supreme Court cases that are openly considering whether race should be a factor in any decision that we make in America. Um, certainly in terms of educational attainment and even access, that's really, really important. Um, as we consider the multiple levels of a North Star, one of the things I'm really liking about this uh, is not only the creating of spaces, but also the, the cross-pollinating of spaces, the the connecting of different spaces and the way that youth are kind of coming into collaboration with each other online and offline. Um, I'm interested in thinking just very pragmatically for a moment and so much as that you all have worked in actual school spaces and the way that you've connected those school spaces to larger movements in the communities around them and also allowed the communities to inform the work and the activities going on in the school. Anybody that would like to speak directly to the way that that has informed inflected the teaching and learning processes invited to do so. Well, I think one of the concepts that the professor has written about in terms of supplementary education uh, speaks to that issue of bringing families, communities, teachers, principals, other stake school stakeholders and district together for the greater good of all the children. Not only the ones who have been marginalized, who have been underserved, but all. And I think I'm um, getting back to that point of the pervasiveness of the social justice and equity principle, permeating conversations across the board will do a whole lot to bring, to lift all the boats for all children. I find one of the uh, one of the first steps is to democratize our language. Um, the, uh, those of us who spend so much time in academia tend to kind of speak in ways only the rest of us um, can can readily uh, uh, sort of pick up and understand, um, and and that produces an inauthentic barrier between research and practice. And, and I, I you know I, I call it inauthentic on purpose because you know it, it's essentially uh, a, uh, an established privilege right 
um, uh, for us to have language that only we can talk to each other about and, and, and write, write to each other about. Um, and so one step in, in this journey um, is to democratize the language and to use language um, that is more accessible um, and uh, more approachable. Um, and the best way to do that is to, is to really be in authentic conversation with teachers and leaders and have, let their language, you know, their words for things um, drive the, 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 the way forward. Joaquin talked about readiness. Um, I think uh, uh, some of our funders have, have charged us um, to only work in places that are ready. And, uh, and that to me is another example of, of, uh, of uh, reinforcing privilege. Whereas what uh, Dr. Noguera's work is, is really about you know, building folks place to a space of readiness um, and, um, and owning our responsibility of reacting to their readiness when, when they bring forward uh, demands for change and, and uh, new ideas for how schools should be organized, um, you know, to, to, to work in a way that considers that, um, uh, that asset a powerful and thoughtful thing and not a disruptive and problematic thing. So I, I agree with the, the power of democratizing language And, and, and I want to add that I think that what, in addition to using the language that everyone uses, we should, sh we should figure out ways to bring, again, the people we seek to serve into the precision of language. Because one of the reasons that academic language has survived for as long as it has is that when it comes to problems, it's precise. And precise problems vex people every day. And in order to solve them, we have to get precise about what the vexing agents are. So yes, we should use the language that everyone uses, but we should also bring people that we seek to serve into the life of precision because precision will help us make progress on all the things that we are talking about in this call. I guess I'd also add that the examples that I shared of folks mobilizing and attempting to take action in response to uh, something that was seen as a problem were often motivated by agreement that there was a problem. And in coming together to address that, that common issue that was problematic, uh, common language was developed and formed and became useful and as, um, again, Dr. Gomez is pointing out, not only are, uh, is a common language developed, but people's knowledge, their, capa their capacity, right? The skill and knowledge in relation to the issue uh, has the potential to grow. People can go from knowledge of to more of the knowledge of how to, right? Um, some of the examples that I shared were were community driven, one, some are tribal, um, some are individuals who are being supported by leaders to take, to use their agency um, and, and engage others. Um, but in, in each of these, uh, there was a degree of, of leadership that supported and enabled, uh, that was willing to listen, right? Uh, for that mutual accountability to, to, to be experienced or, or to be prioritized, there had to be somebody who normally has the power to do it the way they want to do it, to say, okay, I don't think I know enough, or me doing it alone may not be effective enough. I need to bring others to the table. And um, there's, so, there's, there's so much that Dr. Gordon has written um, in relation to the social capital and cultural capital and, and what's possible, what can be generated when we bring those different stakeholder groups together and focus on a common challenge. Um, I think that's also kind of um, relevant to the alignment, the, the how-to of it all. And, and uh, we don't have the answers alone again. Um, it's through solidarity, through uh, having a common focus and, 
and developing common language that we can start to make progress on some of these issues that have been around for a very long time. Yeah, I would add that the Gordon Commission itself was a really interesting exercise in building common language among diverse professionals. I mean, mm. as, as Joaquin knows, it's not, this is a hard problem. And it has, you know, it has lots and lots of rough edges that people have to be committed to smoothing. And the Gordon Commission was a very, on the future of assessment, was a really amazing example of creating a common ecology out of isolated ones. It was quite interesting in that regard. One way that I've been reflecting on supplementary and comprehensive education, which uh, Eleanor mentioned, um, is to think about the kinds of life experiences that, uh, that Professor Gordon and his wife made available to their own children um, and matched interests with opportunities and uh, kind of opportunities for defiance and agency and kind of sense making and difference making. Uh, with what was developmentally appropriate for uh, someone in elementary school or, uh, you know, or uh, an adolescent or somebody transitioning to college. Um, and I think back to a quote from uh, an individual running a comprehensive education program uh, from one of Professor Gordon's books. Um, and, and the quote is, what we are doing is a compilation of things that everybody knows we should be doing. What they, the visitors, take home, we hope, is the idea that we love our kids and we'll do whatever's necessary to get them to succeed. Stating the goal is just the first step. Getting there takes hard work, dedication, creativity, passion, intellectual rigor, and patience. But commitment is what fuels the process. And when I look at America, I have to question our commitment to our country's children. As any caring parent can tell you, there's no phase in a child's life where you can just step back and safely assume that they will be fine. From their first awkward attempt at walking uh, to their stepping up to receive their college diploma, children stumble and fall. Sometimes they need to be helped up and sometimes they need to learn how to struggle on their own. Caring parents are always vigilant, watching their children as they grow up and stepping in when necessary. That vision of responsibility um, is really different from the punitive sorting, depriving of opportunity approach to accountability that we've taken as a country. Um, and I personally am, am deeply inspired by the way that Professor Gordon has continued to kind of silently, uh, you know, and, and, and persistently uh, beat the drum that our level of commitment to all children having what we would want for our own children is a deeply important uh, kind of frame uh, for, uh, you know, kind of what must education and educators, uh, you know, provide. I want to move in a little bit of a critical direction with these last 10 minutes, if you don't mind. The session is focused on classroom settings, innovations and in learning and instruction. The next session is going to move towards assessments ability to integrate teaching and learning. As we've been talking about the building of community, mutual intelligibility and language, I hear a lot of talk about parents, community leaders, school leaders, uh, and teachers also I think we've really highlighted and underscored in so many other you know emphatic verbs the role that youth students themselves play the the testing community test designers folks that work in assessment houses we haven't much talked about them but I think that it's important to think about how we bridge the communities we're talking about with the communities that we haven't been talking about as much I'm just wondering how folks feel about that and how we take steps in that direction and whether it aligns with the North Star that we've identified earlier. And so much of Dr. Gordon's work has been in engaging of those communities. Um, and I think that it makes sense to continue to do it, but they don't always, in my personal view, seem to directly align. Maybe we need to invite them to the kind of conversations that Dr. Nagera and Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Tucker have talked about. And maybe the collective persuasion over time 
me, 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 um, unfreeze the, the, the ice that seems to put some sort of block toward collective conversation of all that have an interest in the promoting of intellective competence for all. Because they have a role to play too. The measurement folks, the test developers, the policy makers at that level who have the power to say, we still want the standardized test. What if the others say no? How might we invite them to a conversation where we explain the meaning of no? And with the hope that they turn into a, oh, I like that. Wouldn't that be great? Let's see, let's see if in the next session, we hear any openings that might give us hope for them joining our conversation. The ones that we are talking about here, Dr. Gomez, Dr. Tucker, you, Jonathan, uh, Dr. Mitchell, yes, Dr. Nogueira. I would love for them to have been part of this conversation. Love it, but. Uh, Elena, I must jump in here because I, I need your help. If you who follow me can do anything, why don't we try to help the measurement industry to recognize that they can do good, they can make money by doing good. What I'm currently, the hobby horse I'm riding now is that tests can measure, but they can also educate. Suppose mm -hmm. there were a demand on the test industry that it become far more active in facilitating learning. Suppose we had learners expecting that from them, teachers asking for their help on it. Mm -hmm. And they discovered that, yeah, they could make a billion dollars a year helping people learn more so than measuring what they have or have not learned. Oh. And to pick up on Professor Gomez's framing about intellective competence and character from the Gordon Commission, um, it, it's both about kind of supporting that becoming, the, the serving, informing, and enhancing uh, young people to learn and thrive. But to quote you, Professor, uh, you argue that what we want learners to know about specific disciplines and to be able to do in meeting these standards must be considered as instrumental to the achievement of what we want learners to be, or, or, or as instrumental as what we want learners to be and to become. So you make this argument about becoming, uh, that, that, that being educated means becoming a good citizen and a good person, so that in your words, real life requires that people not only have the knowledge, but they are willing and able to act upon it. Um, and so as long as we're casting a vision of what it means to learn and thrive, to be educated, that's as broad as what you call for, I'm happy to invite a whole range of people to the table to develop tools towards that vision of intellective competence and character. But are they, are they, are they likely to be persuaded with the dollar? Because that may seem to be a bottom line issue for them. They may empathize with your position, but practically they may say, mm, where's the money? Show me the, the money. Show me the money. Uh, let me show you the money. <laughs> let me show you the money. The money uh, to follow, um, to follow what you just said, Eric. I, I mean, I think that's right now measurement and measurement thinking and measurement analytics are privately held. I think the money exists in making measurement community property. Mm -hmm. And if measurement were community property and trying to figure out how to genuinely help every parent, every teacher to become someone who can use analytics for learning, that, in, that raises the customer base to something huge. Mm -hmm. So my advice to you, so that my advice to the next session is talk about how to make measurement community property. <laughs> yeah, I heard. wanted to add two thoughts to that. Um, I think that's a great suggestion, um, Louis, Dr. Gomez. Um, but the first thing I wanted to say was, you know, people haven't forgotten the harm caused through 
accountability yeah, via not. punishment, right? This is not <laughs> this is not long ago, right? A pandemic gave us a, a brief break here. Um, but you know, just like in many, many situations where someone has been harmed, um, there's a there's a, a, a quote out of South Africa in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, healing is possible when people people can begin to heal when they feel like they've been heard. It would be powerful that for the measuring community, the measure those folks invested in this work to kind of own up to where we've been and publicly say, hey, we want some help with redoing this. The reality is assessments are really powerful tools, but they can be powerful weapons and they have been. Yes. Um, I also have just a, a quick quote from a school that I did a study at an ethnographic case study of um, where this exact topic came up. And this is an exchange with one of the founders that I had. Uh, they said that they were talking with one of the uh, accountability groups for their school. And they said, um, are, they questioned them. They said, are reading scores evidence of student progress? And the people responded, yes, okay. He said, okay, well, is cultural identity evidence of student progress? And they said, no. He said, well, then I said, then we're done here. You don't have the authority to evaluate us because we're a community school. We have the right to self-determination and what progress is for our own children. And that includes me. I'm speaking to you as a parent whose child goes to the school. I'm telling you that I'm more interested in whether my children, my sons have a strong cultural identity and their, the strength of their relationships with their peers. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna show up on your test. Mm -hmm. so I'm saying, I don't care if my sons can read yet. I'm saying I care how they interact with people. And if they grow up to be good people, they will demand that they know how to read. You're talking to me as if you believe that these lagging indicators are leading indicators, but it's the other way around. I think there's something to that. There's something that that even if we don't agree with it, we must confront this this kind of um, approach that families are bringing to schools. And um, mm -hmm. you know what? How what what say these uh, the evaluators? If, if measurement belonged to the community, examples like that I think would be less prominent because I mm -hmm. think harm lives when knowledge is held, when knowledge is hoarded. And if you make knowledge community property, less harm is possible, I think. Powerful ending note. We have one minute left in this session. Let's just have a whole conference about this topic, but we can start by seeing how the next session goes. I want to thank all the conference organizers. I want to eat thank each of the panelists. And of course, I want to thank Dr. Gordon for a lifetime scholarship that makes it all possible.